uh, cockpit voice recorders. Pan Am realized that the tail end was trying to take off. Um, they attempted to climb out early. They didn't have enough energy to, to get in the air. And they struck the side of Pan Am. And this is a computer generation of how uh, the things looked. Well, it was a tragedy. 583 passengers died that day and flight crew. Uh, it was one of the worst aviation disasters. Uh, everybody on KLM was uh, killed, and there were 61 survivors on Pan Am. And one of them was the co-pilot, who became one of the leading safety um, uh, advocates for aviation. So that's kind of what things looked like afterwards. This is an actual photograph of uh, the situation. That's actually the Pan Am plane right there. So this was a wake-up call for aviation, and it led to the development of a process called crew resource management. And again, I'm finding that a lot of places are teaching this as part of surgical safety, which is great. Um, and I'll come back to that here in just a second. But it's taken aviation decades to find solutions to their problems. It's been a constant you know, process of figuring out how we make things better, trying it, modifying it. Well, for medicine, our wake-up call was the 1999 Institute of Medicine report that estimated somewhere between 48 and 96,000 patients died every year because of uh, medical errors. And that's surprising to a lot of folks. And there was a lot of denial when this came out that, oh, it cannot be this many patients. But when you think about it, that's two to five patients a day in Tennessee alone. Pretty startling facts there. So comparing the two industries, they're both highly technical, uh, they do technical procedures, they require high levels of human skills, sophisticated equipment, um, and you add the stressors of time and uh, death to it, and it makes them pressure cookers in a lot of cases. And what's been realized for a lot of us in medicine is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and solve these problems uh, from scratch. Aviation has done a lot of the heavy lifting, a lot of the work, and we can modify some of their concepts uh, to both uh, medicine in general and the operating room. So in order to understand some of this, we have to look a little bit at human error. Um, you know, mistakes are always making. We're human. We've all, always heard that. Um, and James, Re James Reason uh, was able to put together a model that was pretty good for both aviation and for medicine called the Swiss cheese model of accidents. And he admitted and realized that we are creatures of habits. And there are errors that occur. There can be personal errors, such as forgetfulness, poor motivation, carelessness, negligence, the things that lawyers love to uh, drill us about. And there can be system-wide errors, uh, organizational errors, uh, uh, time pressure, understaffing, equipment uh, design. Um, and these all can lead to uh, issues. And what he developed was this Swiss cheese model that only when the holes in the Swiss cheese line up do you go from a hazard to a loss. And that with more layers in the Swiss cheese, there's less likelihood of an error occurring. But it was a pretty unique concept, and you know it makes sense. So he looked at highly reliable organizations, mainly the nuclear industry, the aviation industry, and noticed that they built in multi-layers to prevent errors, and that there was a preoccupation with the possibility of failure in those cultures, and they expected to make errors. And they trained their personnel to recognize these errors and how to recover from them. They rehearsed or drilled for possible uh, failures, and they placed in checks and balances to help keep uh, these errors from occurring. And when they did, they learned to shut down and reevaluate. Overall, they planned for the worst but expected the best. So one of the things that came to light with, of this was the fact that usually most accidents do not occur for just one reason. There's a process, there's a chain that occurs with accidents. And a perfectly good example was John Kennedy Jr.'s crash in 1999. Um, he made multiple errors here. And if he had just listened to one of, or rectified one of these errors, probably would still be alive today. He was a private pilot. He was not instrument rated, so he only could fly when he could see. Uh, he was attending his cousin's wedding out in Martha's Vineyard and had to be there. It's what we call got to get there itis, and that makes you make bad decisions when you feel like you're forced to do something, even though the situation or the environment is not safe to do so. 
He had recently had an un, uh, ankle uh, injury. He was not fit to fly. He had just purchased a new aircraft that he was not familiar with. Uh, weather was deteriorating. He had not flown in a while, so he was not proficient. And he had significant stressors. His magazine was failing. His marriage was having issues. And we kind of look at this and, and say, you know, what was he thinking? As pilots were like, why would you get in the air with all this going on? Well, the one thing I'd like you all to think about, what if he was a surgeon and was going to the operating room? How would we feel? So that's enough about safety. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the other benefits that we can learn from aviation. Uh, we can use some of their uh, aspects to improve our training, to reduce our stress, to become more efficient, uh, become more confident, have better outcomes, uh, learn how to adapt better, and have overall better satisfaction for ourselves, our patients, and our staff. So let's begin talking about a little bit of training. Um, on the left here, this is a Piper Cub. This is a very basic panel with basic instruments. Uh, on the right here, this is the cockpit of a Boeing 777. Now they both use the same concepts. You have the issue of lift versus weight, thrust versus drag. They both fly. They both can get you from one lo location to the other. But if you were to put a pilot who is used to this cockpit into this cockpit, you're not going to get the same results. Well, the same is true in minimally invasive surgery. You put someone who may be used to using a traditional laparoscope and you stick them on the surgical console for the robot, they both can perform a hysterectomy, but you're probably not going to get the same results. And so there's a process that has to be learned in order to adapt to the equipment or the environment that you're in. So looking at how pilots and surgeons train, there's some similarities and there's some differences. Uh, pilots start off with ground school, they go on to dual instruction, they practice uh, all phases of flights and hopefully their, their landings equal their takeoffs, if not uh, there's been a bad event. Uh, they use simulation, they then learn how to fly by themselves and then they go on to uh, do cross-country flights, learn how to navigate. And the final step is an FAA check ride, which is uh, basically the FAA saying, hey, you are okay to fly. You can operate this aircraft in a safe, manage, man, uh, safe manner. Excuse me. And then they go on and get their pilot certificate. In uh, surgery, similar process. We start off with lecturing. We participate in cases. Uh, may do some dry labs. We're now embracing simulation. We start off doing basic cases. There's really no comparison to cross country. And we're starting to see some skills assessments to make sure that folks are able to perform in the operating room before they finish residency and then they graduate residency. Well, for pilots, they can go on and do additional training. They can fly what we call IFR, instrument flight rules, where they can fly in the clouds, don't have to see anything. Uh, it's like looking at a, a sheet of white paper in front of you, but you're still able to keep that aircraft uh, upright and moving. And they can go on and get type ratings in different aircrafts with increased complexity. And we're starting to see that with uh, additional, um, excuse me, with additional uh, fellowships in minimally invasive gynecology and advanced training even after you finish residency. So when you're learning how to fly and you have a map, the main thing you're having to do is find the airport. So you just need a basic map. Uh, when you go on and you're doing advanced uh, uh, flying, such as instruments, uh, there's a lot more information that you need. Not only do you have to know where the airport is, in order to land when you can't see, you have to be on a certain course, at a certain height, at a certain place in the uh, approach to be able to get that plane down safely and line up with the runway. And so there's a big difference between being able to see uh, your uh, runway and breaking out uh, barely above your runway and having to make sure that you can land that plane uh, when you're coming out of the clouds. And this is a, a low approach, what it would look like when you were um, uh, flying on a day like today. Well, the same thing is true in minim minimally invasive surgery. You know, pretty much we, we all can deal with normal anatomy. You know, we know where the, the ureters are supposed to be. We know where the uterine vessels are supposed to be. And pretty much most folks can handle something like this. But when you start increasing the complexity with multiple fibroids, you can't see the, fibro uh, the uterine vessels, uh, you may not even uh, know where the ureters are beginning and where they're uh, going to, 
uh, it adds some sophistication to the case and you have to start thinking outside the box in order to uh, find a solution. So questions are being raised. Is the current training model in OBGYN enough to, give, uh, to handle the advances that are occurring in technology? We know that other specialties are starting to embrace skills assessments as far as their um, requirements for graduating residents, such as the uh, general surgery. In Europe, they pretty much will put you through a skills test. And depending on how you perform on this test, you're given one of three cards. And this card will indicate what you can do in the operating room. If your skills are adequate, they're good, uh, they'll give you a green card. You can pretty much do any case you want. If your skills are kind of borderline, they'll give you a yellow card. You can do some limited cases, maybe some basic hysterectomies. They're not going to let you handle endometriosis. They're not going to um, allow you to handle large uh, fibroid uteruses. And if your skills are nowhere near where they need to be, they're going to give you an orange card, which means you're not going to be doing a tubal without an assistant. So um, we're seeing that training programs are embracing this, and some are requiring residents to uh, perform on certain levels with simulation and or dry labs before they're going to sign off and say that your minimally invasive skills are adequate. And we're seeing that even on the upper levels in fellowship. There's now a written exam and soon to be a skills exam for all fellows to pass before they will be able to exit uh, their fellowship programs. So. With this technology, you know, we're talking about not only traditional laparoscopy, we're talking about robotics. Uh, there's been developments of training uh, uh, networks for robotic surgery. Uh, the robotic training network is now uh, up and going. It has set uh, didactics that are required for residents to complete before they can assist at the bedside or they can get on the console. And it's laid out pretty well and you have to check certain boxes and be able to demonstrate certain skills before you can progress. But what's really interesting about this is they're developing a skills assessment for physicians after they get out into private practice. It's a ball about this big with several tasks and you videotape yourself doing these tasks on this ball and then you send the ball in and you send your videotape in and it's evaluated to see if your skills are still adequate or not. And we're starting to see a significant discussion in residency education about whether or not there should be skills assessments, uh, not just knowledge assessments uh, for residents to complete before they do uh, finish their programs. And private practices and private hospitals are now looking at this too. Uh, they are now not only uh, asking for your case numbers, they're asking for documentation that your skills are adequate. Some of them are requiring you to do simulation, or some of them are requiring you to document the complexity of your cases, your complication rates, uh, your additional training before they're going to let you uh, into their OR uh, and do minimally invasive surgery. So the other question being asked, should there be a minimum number of cases for credentialing? We understand that with minimally invasive surgery, there are significant learning curves. And for robotics, there's been suggestions that it should be between 50 or 100 cases before folks are proficient on the console. Um, some of these uh, are a little bit higher for uh, like urogyne and for GYN oncology. And the next question that's being asked, should there be a minimum number of cases to maintain privileges? Uh, low volume surgeons have significantly, and we're not talking about just you know, minor statistical changes, we're talking about significant higher complication rates, morbidity rates, cost, longer operative times, and hospitals realize this and they're now starting to limit the number of uh, doctors that may be able to perform minimally invasive surgery in order to make sure that surgeons have high enough volumes to keep their skills up. So my friend John Lanahan uh, over in Tacoma, Washington uh, presented this slide a, a couple years back and he compared uh, the different types of hysterectomies to different events and the amount of training that was required uh, for uh, that level. And he started off talking about an abdominal hysterectomy. Uh, it's kind of like riding a bike. Uh, you need initial training, but then you, know, you pretty much can uh, go from there. And although uh, we're getting less and less abdominal hysterectomies, that's not true nationwide. Over 50% of all hysterectomies in this country are still done abdominally. Why? That's a good question. I think a lot of it has to do with physician preference, physician skills, and cultural issues. 
Uh, goes on to talk about driving a car versus a vaginal hysterectomy, flying an airplane versus lap laparoscopic approaches, and flying a jet engine uh, aircraft uh, with robotics, and that the amount of skills and training that's required increases with each of those. So let's talk a little bit about that concept of recurring tr recurrent training. Uh, it's already there in aviation. Uh, every two years, I have to go up with a flight instructor, and I have to demonstrate to that flight instructor that I can still operate that aircraft in a safe and efficient manner. We don't have that in uh, surgery. We both have continuing education. Um, there is what's called an instrument proficiency check. Every once in a while, I have to go up with an instructor, and I have to show them that I can operate that plane in instrument conditions and get that plane on the ground in a safe manner. Um, we're starting to see that with advanced skills assessments that are being uh, implemented both uh, in residency and out in private practice. And for commercial pilots, every six months to a year, they go on a simulator and they rehearse emergency procedures. They show that they have those um, skills down pat. Uh, we don't have the same thing in surgery, but maybe we should consider that. <clears throat> So that brings up the question, should there be requirements for recurrent training if no cases have been done for an extended period of time? Well, studies show that in as little as 12 weeks, robotic skills deteriorate. They start deteriorating after two weeks off the console, but after 12 weeks, you've lost your uh, edge, your ability to operate uh, the robot. They can be reestablished, though. If uh, folks go to a dry lab or if they go on a simulator, those skills can be reestablished within a couple of hours. And some hospitals are now requiring that if you've been off the console for more than a month, that you have to do a certain number of hours on the simulator before they will let you operate on a patient. And some hospitals are requiring you to do the same if your complication rates are higher than expected uh, before they'll let you back in the OR. So it brings up a concept, should we be responsible to ourselves for setting our limits? Um, in aviation, we have what's called personal minimums. Uh, I am licensed or approved by the FAA to shoot an instrument approach down to 200 feet above the ground. But does it make sense for me to do that in a mountain area like this uh, if I haven't flown in three months? Maybe I should say my limit's going to be 500 feet, that if I can't see the runway by then, then I don't need to continue the approach. And it's important that each uh, pilot sets their own personal limits by their own abilities. And this is something that you should do before you get in the airplane, not while you're flying and are pressured to, to uh, change your minimums. And maybe the same should be true for surgery. You know, does it make sense to do an eight fibroid myomectomy First day you're back from vacation, and after you've uh, had to take call all night because uh, you've got to pay everybody back, um, it may be permissible, but it doesn't make sense either. Well, none of us in this room have egos. Uh, I think that's uh, not the case. I mean, that's part of what attracts pilots to aviation, and that's part of what attracts doctors into medicine. Um, and one of the things is egos can write checks that you can't always cash, and a lot of times, we realize that we can get away with things most of the time. Uh, nine times out of 10, even though you pushed a bad position, you may get away with it. But that 10th time, it could be a disaster. And I jokingly say that the most dangerous words in the English language are watch this. Well, maybe it might need to be hold my beer and watch this, but still, it's, uh, it's a concept that we need to avoid when we're in the operating room. It's not a time to show off. It's a time to be efficient and to take care of the patient and try to put your egos aside, and that's part of the personal minimum concept. So before you fly, you have to do a significant amount of planning. Uh, you know, we start looking at weather a couple days ahead of time, trying to figure out uh, if it's safe to fly. And the perfectly good example was that I was supposed to fly in uh, yesterday uh, afternoon, but the weather that we got last night was where I was taking off, so the night before I had to uh, fly uh, to Knoxville uh, to where my brother lives and uh, then do a hop over here the following morning. So surgeons should maybe consider looking at their schedules a couple days ahead of time, kind of planning out, am I going to need additional equipment? Are there certain personnel that I should have in the operating room to help me with a particular case? Uh, before you get in the plane, uh, you check the aircraft, walk around, make sure everything is working before you get in the air. And that may be a good concept, and it's one that I practice in the OR. I usually will go to the OR five or ten minutes before my case is supposed to start, 
and make sure that everything's in order. And uh, you know, experience is a great teacher. You know, finding out that your mesh is expired when you're doing a sacral copalpexy after your patient is asleep is not a good feeling. And so by planning ahead and checking those things out, you can prevent a lot of problems. Uh, commercial pilots have what's called dispatchers that look at potential delays. Well, we have the same. We have o OR uh, um, personnel that uh, keep the schedule going. They uh, provide updates. Uh, if Dr. Smith is uh, scheduled for two hours to do a hysterectomy and normally takes four hours, I think you, know, you can kind of look at the schedule and realize, okay, I'm going to be delayed. Um, so they can help uh, with uh, you know, updating you on your workflow and how things are going to be. And um, you may need to look at your own schedule. What's your schedule like in clinic? Are you going to be able to get to the OR in time? And if not, maybe adjust. So before we fly, we get what's called a briefing. Uh, we call and they tell us what the weather conditions are, how things look, where we're taking off, where we're landing, and uh, what we can expect, and what's called NOTAMs, or Notice to Airmen. Uh, this lets you know that uh, uh, certain things may be happening either at your destination or takeoff airport, because the last thing you want to find out when it's 1 o'clock and you're getting ready to land and you're low on fuel is the airport's closed from 10 to 2 o'clock that particular day. So it helps you anticipate changes in those plans. And conditions change in surgery. The, you know, we, we all know that. Uh, there can be equipment issues, anesthesia may have uh, issues, uh, personnel may not be available. And so by thinking ahead and planning ahead, you can kind of anticipate some of these things and make your day a little bit less stressful. One of the things that I try to do is brief my team before we start. I try to tell them, hey, we've got a very large immobile uterus. I'm expecting. Uh, deep uh, endometriosis in the uh, posterior cul-de-sac. Um, this particular patient uh, has uh, some res respiratory compromise, which may affect our Trendelenburg, uh, things like that. And I don't know what your patient population is like, but we have a significant problem with obesity in Mississippi. And in the South, it is not polite to discuss a woman's age or weight, but you can discuss their height. Mm -hmm. So some of my patients need to be about eight feet for their particular weight, and I call them Southern Petite. So um, that leads to certain problems in the OR. You have to you know, anticipate those. You may want to check to see how the patient tolerates Trendelenburg uh, before uh, you dock the robot. Or you may want to ask the... Uh, anesthesiologists if pressure control ventilation might be a better option for this patient than volume control ventilation. So one of the things that you do when you're planning is you think about where you might end up going, not where you're going. And you may deal with busy air spaces or weather issues. And you kind of try to figure out, OK, the winds are a certain direction there. I'm probably going to land on this particular uh, runway. And a perfectly good example is if I'm flying from my home base, which is Golden Triangle, Columbus, Mississippi, uh, to one of the smaller airports in Atlanta, just north of Atlanta Hartsfield here, I may ex want to go this way, which is called direct. But more than likely, this is the way I'm going to end up going, to be uh, rerouted around all the traffic coming and going from Atlanta Hartsfield. And so I pretty much know Somewhere about right here, I'm going to get a call from air traffic control telling me I'm going this way instead of this way. So you kind of plan for those things ahead of time. And the same thing's true uh, in the OR. Sometimes it's good to kind of run through what you expect with a case. And one of the things that works well for me is the night before, I actually will close my eyes and I will visualize the steps of the surgery. You know, I'll kind of go through, okay, patient's asleep. Uh, we're going to position the patient. You know, um, we got our trocars in. We're going to dock in this particular way from the side instead of between the legs. Uh, I'm expecting that this patient's had two previous C-sections, so there's going to be some adhesions. Maybe I should consider going in the left upper quadrant at Palmer's Point instead of um, going uh, in at the umbilicus. So it allows you to kind of uh, predict some of the things that may uh, occur for your particular case. Uh, one of my favorite sayings is, plan for the worst, expect the best, never disappointed. So aviation developed this model called crew resource management. And it was developed uh, in response to that Tenerife accident. And it's basically a set of training procedures where uh, human errors can have devastating uh, effects. And it's focused mainly on interpersonal communication, 
leadership and decision making. And this is what's led to the timeout, the surgical timeout that all of us perform before we begin surgery. And um, it has some pretty good uh, principles, you know, open communication, prioritization, uh, workflow management. And part of that is based on the fact that uh, the FAA says that I, as the pilot in command, is directly responsible for, and the final authority is how that aircraft operates. And the same thing is true in surgery. We are the surgeon. We are the one that's responsible. We are the captain of the ship. But with that command comes responsibility. And one of the things that I realized early on in, uh, when I was operating on the uh, robotic console is that you can't put your head in that console and expect everything to work like it should around you. You still have to actively manage your team. And part of that is I jokingly call that surgical console the time machine. You can lose more time in that console than you realize. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you don't realize it's been 15 or 20 minutes that you've been on a particular task because uh, you've been so focused on, you know, what's going on in there. And you can isolate yourself from your team in ways that are not uh, intended, and things can start going bad around you. A perfectly good example was uh, a urologist colleague of mine uh, was doing a sacral copalpexy. And he thought that the uh, manipulator uh, that they were using was in the vagina and was dissecting out what he thought was the vesicovaginal space. Well, it turns out that his uh, staff thought that he wanted it in the rectum. And so he was actually dissecting out the rectovaginal space and didn't realize that, that was going on. So those are things that you have to kind of think about. So one of the things that came up was there was a big problem in aviation that, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that, uh, you know, a lot of pilots were acting as if they were kings, that uh, that cockpit door was meant to isolate them. You didn't cross that barrier. And uh, what's been changed by crew resource management is um, that you are more like a quarterback. You are managing your team. You are not dictating to your team. But you've got to know that everybody's doing their job and that everybody knows what the play is and that you know, things can change and you can get a blitz. And this is a great quote from Lin uh, Vince Lombardi that uh, talks about excellence. And I think it's a great philosophy to have in the operating room. We may try to attain uh, perfection and we will chase it. We may never attain it, but along the way we find excellence. And I think that's a great philosophy to have uh, when you're operating. So before a flight begins for commercial pilots, they huddle with their entire flight crew. They discuss potential issues like are there going to be turbulence issues that's going to affect the ability to uh, serve uh, you know, beverages in the uh, uh, cabin. Are they going to have an extended hold because of weather? Uh, is that going to mean uh, passengers need to be rebooked? Gate agents can start working on that. Um, do they need extra fuel on board because they're going to have to hold an extended period of time? And so that brings up an important point for us as surgeons. Maybe we need to do the same thing, um, and I try to do the same thing with my team. You know, if I'm anticipating uh, significant endometriosis, I want EEA sizers that I can place in the rectum to be able to dissect out the uh, rectum there. Um, if it's going to be a longer, more complex case, I try to communicate to anesthesia so that they can use longer acting paralytics. Um, and then, you know, uh, your OR coordinator can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Uh, and keeping them informed and letting them know that you expect it may be a longer case or you're going to be delayed allows them to uh, deal with their personnel and their resources and makes them a whole lot happier. And they will, in turn, make your uh, case go a little bit better. And it's also important to talk with your, your uh, surgical staff. You know, letting them know uh, what you're expecting allows them to plan ahead. And knowing that uh, your star uterine manipulator has a doctor's appointment at 12 noon and it's 11 o'clock, you know, you, you're probably going to have to plan for somebody else to take their place. And you'd probably be uh, happier choosing who that person is than someone just being assigned. So it brings up the question, how well do each of us communicate with our OR team? And uh, I think this kind of sets that, that tone right there, that it's important that we all uh, kind of make sure that we're on the same sheet of music uh, during surgery. So one of the things that aviation does that I think we can learn a lot from is standardization. They use what's called SOP, or Standard Operating Procedures. Um, 
when you walk into an aircraft, you see a pilot and a co-pilot. Well, they may not know each other from Adam's house cat. They may have never worked together, but that flight still occurs in a safe and professional manner. And the reason is, is that each team member has dedicated roles and they know the steps in the process. The equipment, the plane is laid out exactly the same way. Their checklists, their charts are laid out in the exact same manner. Operational limits are previously set before they even set foot in that aircraft. And everybody is trained to the same minimal level. And these are things that maybe we need to look at in uh, the surgical arena. A perfectly good example is where I am, we do not have a dedicated robot team, and that was becoming a huge liability. And so we decided to adapt standardization in order to reduce that liability. And so what we decided was that the room was going to be set up exactly the same way for every case, and that the tables and the trays were going to be set up the same way, and we put pictures up on the wall so that if someone who normally does orthopedics was staffing the case uh, for GYN, they could see how that table was supposed to be laid out. And I knew that if I was to reach at this particular place on my uterine manipulator uh, table, that I would grab my tenaculum every time. And so it improved our efficiency and also the safety. And one of the things we looked at was some of our costs. And one of the things we realized was that we were opening up a lot of equipment that we weren't using. And a lot of that was being discarded. And so what we decided was we're going to have a standard tray and we're going to have a box in the room for each surgeon that has the equipment that they may want so that if they ask for it, it can be opened immediately and nobody has to run out of the room and get it. And that's really cut down on some of our OR times. We uh, decided that we were going to define roles and who was qualified to do those roles. And we um, implemented some checklists that we uh, make sure that are done before patients roll into the room. So how many of you all have ever had a case go exactly the way you thought it was going to be. Yeah, same experience here. Pretty much every time I get in somebody's abdomen, there's something there that I'm not expecting. And um, one of the things that is a major problem in aviation is dealing with unusual situations. Um, uh, again, one of my favorite aviation quotes, never let an airplane take you someplace your brain didn't get there five minutes earlier. Um, and there's many a time where I may come upon an airport and I may be too high or going too fast or be too close to uh, another aircraft and it leads me to get out of my normal comfort zone and I suddenly find myself becoming reactive instead of proactive and I start noticing that I'm focusing more on the problem than I am on flying the airplane in a safe manner and that de develops into what's called an undesirable aircraft state that's one step above a crash. And so when you have these situations, you have to think quickly and you have to react quickly. And you have to give yourself some time to work through a problem. So when that happens, what most pilots do is communicate the situation to air traffic control. They put themselves in what's called a holding pattern, which is kind of like a racetrack pattern in the sky. And then you have to decide, is it safe to proceed? Uh, you identify your resources. You may pull out checklists or charts and kind of figure out a plan on how you're going to uh, uh, continue on in a safe manner. Uh, I fly by myself, but cockpit crews fly with two pilots. So there's a delegation of tasks so that folks are not both focusing on the problem and something's happening to the aircraft. And then you engineer a solution. And after that, you decide, okay, is it safe to proceed or do I need to divert and think about a secondary uh, location? Well, in the OR, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, this thought process does not work in emergency situations. But fortunately for most of us, our minimally invasive uh, GYN cases are cases that will allow us to pause and work through a problem. And a perfectly good example is if you have a broad ligament fibroid and it's pushing your uterine vessels dangerously close to your ureter, you have to figure out a different way of doing things than you're normally used to. And the first step is communicating to your team that you have a concern. You know, hey, this doesn't look right. Let's hold for a minute. You've just recognized that you're in an unsafe environment. That's the first step. The next step is, is it safe to proceed? Okay, well, how are we going to problem solve this? Um, can we find the ureter? Do we know where it's going? Uh, do we know where our uterine vessels are uh, coming from? And then you have to kind of figure out and identify resources. You have to make some decisions. Would it be appropriate to dissect out the retroperitoneal space? Are you comfortable dissecting out the retroperitoneal space? Um, maybe 
putting stents in, uh, using a cystoscope would help you identify where your ureter is. Maybe using surgical clips instead of uh, electrocautery to avoid the risk of thermal damage to your ureter. Uh, and if you're not comfortable with any of these situations, do you need to get your GYN oncologist in there to help you out? So you go on to delegate tasks. You know, you may need to send your circulator out for the cysto equipment, or uh, you may need to see if, you know, your GYN oncologist is even available. And then you problem solve. Now, you've got two options. You can say, okay, I hope I don't hit the ureter. Um, and lay awake all night wondering if you did or didn't and praying for the next two weeks the patient doesn't come back uh, with urinary incontinence that uh, is because of a uh, uh, ureteral vaginal fistula. Or maybe you could take the vessels lateral to the ureter instead of right against the cervix. So you have to decide, are you comfortable dissecting out that retroperitoneal space? You know, I'm comfortable with that. Not everybody is. I have some partners that they think that that uh, place has a big, you know, circle with a line through it and is only reserved for GYN oncologists. Um, so they would typically call in uh, one of the uh, uh, subspecialists to help them out uh, when they get that far lateral. So you have to make a decision, do you proceed or do you divert? Let's talk a little bit how we handle emergencies. They're going to happen. They're always going to happen at the worst time. And the good news is that they don't happen too often, but the bad news is they don't happen too often. So they're both a blessing and a, a curse. And how you deal with an emergency situation will dictate your success in that particular crisis. It is normal human nature for all of us that when things get overwhelming, we give up. We just throw our hands up and say, you know, we're done, let fate uh, take over. But that's not the way we can uh, handle things in the operating room. And a perfectly good example uh, of how emergencies are dealt with in aviation is uh, the Miracle on the Hudson. Sully Sullenberger is my hero. Um, how he acted in this particular situation was just incredible. And um, I'm going to play a little recording here. And you can read how he felt about things. And I've had the same feeling in the OR. We may end up in the Hudson, just as calm and cool and collected as if he was talking to somebody on the street, not, oh my God, we're going to die, we're crashing in the Hudson. Um, and so I think he can teach us a lot here. And when they interviewed uh, Sullenberger and his co-pilot, Jeffrey Skiles, they both said their first reaction was disbelief. Uh, they admitted feeling panicked, they, but they remained very calm and professional. And they both commented on how their training kicked in and how they were able to work the problem uh, using crew resource management and emergency checklists. They already had checklists for a water landing. They already had checklists for losing both engines. And they hit the birds at about 2,700 feet and about four miles from LaGuardia. And it took them three minutes and 49 seconds to hit the Hudson. That's not a lot of time to work through a very critical situation. But they had done emergency simulation on a regular basis. Sullenberger was a safety pilot uh, for uh, US Air. And Skiles had just finished his recurrent training. You couldn't have asked for a better crew to be in the cockpit. And they delegated tasks. Uh, Sullenberger was flying the aircraft. He was communicating to air traffic control. Skiles, in the meantime, was running the emergency checklist and trying to get the engines uh, restarted. So they worked the process, and they worked the emergency, and they worked as a team to a positive outcome but didn't quite do everything. They found out later on when they debriefed, there was a switch they were supposed to switch for a water landing that sealed the airplane and allowed it to float longer. So even with checklists, sometimes things do get missed. So during an OR emergency, we want to think we can handle it and that we'll deal with it whenever it happens. But this is not the time to wing it. This is the time to be efficient, methodical, calm, and a time for us to rely on training. And part of that is simulation or drilling on emergency procedures. 
when we did our drill for the first time for a vessel injury, we found out that our laparotomy tray was all the way across the other side of the OR, and it took them three minutes to bring it to the room. That's a critical three minutes that we've lost there uh, in that situation. So we learned that we needed to keep a laparotomy tray closer to our OR room for emergencies. And what's really neat is simulation is constantly evolving, and the next generation of simulators will actually create an emergency for you and let you work through the problem. So that's going to be neat to see how that plays out in the next couple of years. One of the things we realized was that we needed to develop a system of, um, of dealing with emergencies. And so we are developing a laminated three uh, sheets in a three-ring binder that we can pass out to everybody that's in the OR uh, when we have an emergency. And that allows me as a surgeon to focus on the emergency at hand and know that everybody else is starting to work on their tasks. The most important thing in an emergency situation is call for help. You know, we have egos. We think, you know, okay, we'll handle it. Calling for help is a sign of weakness. Actually, it's probably one of the smartest things we can do because that second doctor can run your team while you're dealing with the emergency. And that makes things a lot more efficient for everybody at hand. And the main thing is stay calm. We as surgeons set the tone for our entire operating room. And if we're panicking and we're losing our cool, everybody else is going to do the same. And I always say, you know, in an emergency situation, the first thing to say in your mind is think of Sully, uh, how calm and collected he was about they're going in the Hudson. So checklists allow each member of the team to stay focused, allows them to avoid feeling overwhelmed, panic, unsure about what they're going to do. And the main thing I tell folks is don't try to memorize a checklist. You, your memory will fail you in an emergency situation quicker than anything else in that room. You need to memorize the first couple steps to get things going and then use that checklist to make sure you're not missing things. You got to keep them fairly simple, uh, organized, and you as the surgeon do need to make sure everybody has completed their tasks. But they can be very time consuming if you haven't used them on a regular basis. And a perfectly good example that I use is that there's a pre-flight checklist I have to perform uh, before I can taxi out to the runway. And the first time I pulled that checklist out, I spent more time on that checklist than I realized, and I had run out half my fuel. I had to shut down and refuel before I could go out and uh, 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 fly the airplane. But over time, now, I mean, I can run through this checklist in a, such a short period of time that sometimes my engines don't have enough time to warm up. So it's important that you review them on a regular basis in order for them to be effective. So if I'm in the aircraft and I lose an engine, I have the first several steps memorized. That allows me to keep the aircraft uh, in control and um, allows me to continue to do the most important thing, which is fly the airplane, then work the problem. And the same thing is true in the operating room. And a perfect example is you hit an iliac artery. Every pump, you're losing three cc's of blood. 70 beats per minute, you've lost 210 cc's in a minute. In that three minutes and 49 seconds that Sully Sullenberger had, you've lost 800 cc's of blood. And so I know for myself, all right, if I do this, these are the steps that I have to memorize and I have to know. I have to declare an emergency. I have to get everybody to pull their checklist. I have to try to quickly grasp the bleeding, and I don't keep doing it. If I can't do it on the first time, I'm moving on. If I do grasp it, I pause, let anesthesia kept, catch up, get IV fluids, lines, you know, get uh, everything set up, um, you know, get the vascular surgeon in. Um, one of the po most important things that I have to do is remember to tell my staff, don't take out that instrument that has the vessel. Don't completely undock the robot. Um, that I'm going to need a vertical incision and going on from there. So. I know that in the meantime, my team is using their checklist. Anesthesia is already starting to do their tasks. They've called for their help. The circulators getting blood. Uh, the uh, uh, techs are opening up trays. So after an event occurs, and really this is not just in, for emergencies. This is uh, something that I try to do with every case, and that is to debrief. And I think it's important uh, that you just take a minute after a normal case and talk a little bit about, hey, these are the things we did really well. That's just as important as the things that went wrong. And um, I think, you know, if you have a near-miss event, you probably spend a little bit more time on it. Duh, you know, that's kind of common sense. But one of the things I try to do is avoid uh, creating uh, everybody from uh, being defensive and not receptive. And I try to 
uh, talk about us as a team, you know, saying we or what I did instead of trying to blame and um, make folks think it's their particular problem, that they were the one that they caused the problem. And so I avoid words like you and they. Um, I think it also is a good opportunity to solicit questions and inputs. I still remember uh, a case where one of my scrub techs, um, we were talking about it, and I was saying, you know, that was a really tough dissection. And um, she said to me, well, Dr. So-and-so uses this particular piece of equipment uh, when he runs into this. And it didn't even dawn on me. Um, and so they can be a good source of information, and it's good to get everybody's inputs. Um, I tell my teenage daughters all the time, a negative experience is only a mistake if we don't learn from it. So we're going to have near misses. These are great learning opportunities. These are opportunities that didn't result in an injury but had the potential to do so. And again, another aviation quote, experience is a hard teacher. First comes the test, then comes the lesson. And this is a perfectly good example um, of a near miss. And now you may have to turn your head sideways because when we clicked this earlier, it, it switched uh, orientation. It's very short. You've got to watch very closely. That's the cockpit view of a T-38 uh, advanced jet trainer that's moving at 400 miles per hour. And that blur that went across there was a single engine piston aircraft. And where I am is a major training center for the Air Force. They fly 260 flights a day. They have 475 new hotshot pilots coming out uh, every uh, year. And there is a lot of traffic in that area and near misses can occur. Um, and this was given to me by a friend of mine who's a squadron commander out at Columbus Air Force Base, and they use this as a training video uh, for their T-38 pilots and for civilian pilots flying through the military operating area there uh, at Columbus just to reinforce the point that near misses can occur, and if that doesn't get your heart racing, there's, there's not much that will. So these are great opportunities to debrief, and you know a lot of places require it. And there's one thing in aviation that I wish we would develop in medicine. It's called uh, the Aviation, uh, uh, correction, the Aeronautical Safety Reporting System. And it's run by NASA for, for the FAA. And what it does is it allows surgeons to self, or not surgeons, excuse me, pilots to self-report aviation incidences without the threat of reprisal from the FAA or uh, you know, enforcement uh, from the FAA. And it allows the use of near misses as opportunities to educate. And I would love it if we could develop something like that in medicine. Um, so bad things do happen. And um, how do we recover as surgeons from these bad events? Um, these things can be serious blows to, to your confidence. And some of you have probably already had that. Some of us that are a little bit more uh, aged have definitely had those. And, Doubt and fear can sometimes take over. Uh, you can get very angry about how things happen, and you can uh, feel compelled to blame it on yourself or somebody else. But these are great opportunities to debrief. And it's important, again, what went right along with what went wrong. What was learned? How can we prevent it? And I think a good opportunity uh, is there to discuss it with a more senior colleague. They've probably been there. They probably have some tips on how to deal with that in the future. But the main thing you have to do is you have to get your confidence back. Um, and you don't just go bebopping back into the OR. Uh, it's a process. And you start off with some simulation and do a few easy cases. Maybe ask one of your colleagues to assist you so that you feel like you've got some backup. But the main thing is not to wait too long. Um, the longer you wait, the harder it gets. And then debrief your success. And you know, with time, you'll have an opportunity to share your experiences with others. So, just a quick summary of what all we've discussed. We've talked a little bit about the culture of safety. We've talked about simulation as being widely accepted in medicine, that there are plans for recurrent training uh, uh, to become a mainstay of uh, surgical care, and credentialing is going to start requiring you to demonstrate your skills levels uh, before they're going to let you on the robot or let you on other pieces of equipment, that you want to set up your own personal limits, uh, that planning ahead and briefing before you uh, 
get in the OR can really reduce your stress in the OR. And that uh, using crew resource management uh, allows you to quarterback your OR, uh, that you communicate, you prior prioritize, and you uh, effectively manage your team. Uh, you communicate with your team unexpected findings and how you're going to deal with them. Uh, standardization is something that we can embrace that can make things a lot more comfortable for the OR, using the checklist, uh, recognizing uh, when we're entering an unsafe or an unusual situation and how we can avoid it from spiraling into a catastrophe uh, and finding uh, and giving ourselves enough time to find a solution. How we deal with emergencies by uh, planning ahead and uh, uh, practicing them, dealing with them, staying calm, trying not to memorize a checklist, but know the first couple steps. Uh, near misses, how there are opportunities to improve. These are some of my favorite sayings in aviation. I've used several of them in this presentation. I'll put these back up at the, the, the end of the uh, presentation here for you to read. Some of them do have a little bit of humor, and they work equally as well for surgery as they do for uh, flying. But the main thing is, is that I would like from, for you to take from this discussion today, uh, the next time you go in the OR and you're putting on your surgical garb and you're getting into your mindset for surgery, I'd like you to also take in there some of the best principles we've talked about about aviation. And when you walk in to operate, think of yourself as a hybrid between the two. Um, I appreciate your time. I know that you all have got other things to do. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions or uh, to follow up on anything we've talked about. Uh, I hope everybody has a great Easter. And again, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you all today.